Poetry saved my life the day I fell through the ceiling of my garage attic. I landed below on boxes filled with words written by poets. Only minor contusions to my back and ribs, but observations, admonitions, profound questions from the poets punctured my heart on that fateful day. From a supine position, I could see a circle of friends I had read. Wendell Berry picked me up gently and whispered, it has Though I descend slowly, earthward, out of the air, I rest in peace in you. Lipo emerged, handed me a goblet of plum wine, and spoke this verse. Hard is the journey, hard is the journey, so many turnings, and now where am I? Robert Bly rushed to check my pulse and handed me a headdress of antlers. He inquired if I had been riding on a dragon when I fell. Lawrence Ferlinghetti smoothly elbowed his way past Bly to take my temperature. He told me he had read somewhere the meaning of existence, yet had forgotten just exactly where. Bert Glick muttered just loud enough to hear. He has a cookie aura about him. Billy Collins displayed an x-ray of my anxious heart. I could make out Snyder, Whitman, Rex Roth, and Yates, all curious as to my well-being. Then the men made way for a bevy of female poets. Maya Angelou, Nikki Giovanni, Emily Dickinson, Adrian Rich, surrounded my body with compassion and with words of precision. They checked my blood pressure. Finally, Mary Oliver stepped forward to hold my hand, examining me with an air of attention and presence. She questioned me. Now that you've survived a plunge from above, what will you do with this one? precious life. Now I mentioned that I did work with veterans and being a army veteran myself, um, I wrote this in 2014, literally on Veterans Day. It's the first thing that I've ever written, that I had ever written regarding being a veteran. And it's not so much about me at all, but Remembering Tom Bergeron is its title. It's Veterans Day, 2014. I'm making my way slowly down Newport Avenue. My shoes crunch softly on sidewalks, suffused with fallen leaves of sycamore. My unhurried walk is purposeful. I walk to remember Thomas Howard Bergeron, high school friend, college roommate, now long departed. Tom's identity is etched into the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. Honored panel 58E, row 19. He still comes to me to visit me in dreams, my old college roommate. Six feet five inches tall, trim, slight facial hair, beaming a broad Scandinavian smile, wearing those high above the ankle moccasins he got in Mazatlan in 65. Tom, shot down in a helicopter May 11th, 1968. Casualty province, long on, forever 22. And now remembered this young man from San Lorenzo, on a chunk of ebony granite just east of the shark tank, as a son of San Jose, one of 142. In Archibald MacLeish's poem, The Young Dead Soldiers, they say we leave you our deaths. MacLeish instructs, 
give them their meaning. Tom, it's been 46 years since that damn war claimed you. I have vowed to use this one precious life to give meaning to yours. My shoes crunch softly on sidewalks, suffused with fallen sycamore leaves. Life and death is all around us. Forget me not, in memory of Siglinda Gotthold. When I was small, I could never understand my grandma's fear of water. I learned my Pisces, and they called me fish, and her eyes, blue as the water she feared, never smiled like her mouth did. When she was small, running from swastikas in a war she was birthed into, she crossed a frozen river, watching ice break and people disappear around her. She never learned to swim. She kept going. I remember begging her to join me, overjoyed when she dipped in her feet. I remember her pride every time I made it across the pool and back, never knowing fear in her smile. She taught me, in every way she knew, how to overcome, how to keep going, how to fear and still keep crossing frozen rivers, how to love someone so much you dip your feet into everything you're scared of and smile. I learn every day, every memory, every smile, how to be brave. Um, this poem is titled Letter to Myself. Just because her hands were an ocean doesn't mean you need to live in a riptide. I felt the seas pull too, remember, and drowning is easy. I forgive you for getting sucked in, and when the water forced its way into your mouth, I forgive you for letting it fill your lungs too, and calling this breathing over and over again, as ocean hands kept us in their grasp as we escaped one and fell into another, we, sister, are stronger than the rocks waves tumble to sands. We, sister, are hybrids that learn to breathe underwater, so we, sister, didn't even have to keep our heads above the seas. Don't fear the water now, sister. You have learned to escape the current. We are not now the nymphs we had to become. Breathe air now, sister. I don't even taste the salt anymore. This is called On Gatsby and Grief, in memory of Siglinda Gotthold, Honey Sun, and Josiah. One. I carry my grief like Tom Buchanan proud, mistress on my arm, a public show of our closeness. Two. When the sun has died, the night can't help but seem darker. Three. I've been told by almost all of my friends who ride motorcycles, too, that if they die while riding, they'll have a smile on their face. Four. Gatsby was my first real experience of grief. Because love isn't supposed to let you die. Love is supposed to mean happy endings. Five, when a star dies, it first balloons out to many times its original size, as if to prove one last time just how big, big can be. Six, when I was little, my grandma used to call full moons mica moons, to remind me no matter where we were, we would always see the same one. Seven, when I read the text, he was killed on his bike this weekend. All I could see was his smile. Eight. When the sun, the moon, and a star I call friend are gone, the night seems very dark. Nine. All my grief has taught me is how very big the sky can be. 365 days. Seasons never change. November 15th. 
2012. What's the significance of a date? What's sacred about a number? It's been over seven years since you've passed. Although I knew life's changes would come eventually, it seemed so sudden when you left. After serving the Lord here on earth for 83 years and being an angel down here, you had to leave. I'll admit I've walked in circles for the past 365 days and the day you passed, chronic smoke filled my chest and lungs. I did my absolute best not to be sober. As it helped me to hold back the tears of sorrow, it even eased my pain. Yet as I placed myself in that self-imposed maze, locked myself, my spirit, and my words inside for days at a time, having not a clue of how I'd live in this world without you. Yet no herbs or potions would hide my enormous pain. My love for you is nothing short of everlasting. It has surely stood the test of time, and it is infinite as the number eight. As your blood still courses through my veins, I stand stronger today because of your numerous struggles that you survived along the way. You are the rock on which I stand, my foundation. I thought I'd crumble the day that you left, and of course it seemed hard to catch my breath through the tears. All at once, it seemed I was standing facing the world and my fears all alone, the fear of losing you. But then my words came back, and I couldn't let you leave without saying goodbye. So today, it's been almost seven years since you've left. So here I am, 2,999 days later, celebrating your life. You are God's gift to me, and now you are a gift to God. No matter the number of days that pass since I've last seen your face, it's been 2,299 days, and I'm still counting. This poem is entitled, Royalty, also known as Sisters. Elaborate ebony goddess, you are beyond amazing. As words flow freely from the corners of your being, as corners of my mind start racing. First sight of your elegance, bliss. Chocolate embraced the curves of your silhouette. My eyes locked on a chocolate frame and it remains flawless as ever. Lavender scented kisses embrace the air and the sweet shades of your dark licorice now shine. Queen, allow me to enter your maze. Light rain, mild flurries, poetic words appear in a hurry. Don't you dare hide behind these thoughts that you have hidden inside. Just grab your trusted pen. Storms will always appear. Just leave the pages saturated. As a mask falsely represents the tears of a frowning clown, free falling like a flowing river, the black and the brown exterior Pin the interior right away. Freedom, justice, and unity. Don't you dare hide the things you've hidden inside for fear of approval. Because storms will always appear. Now I've been told that in 1500s England they buried people prematurely due to a comatose state caused by drinking alcohol from lead and pewter cups. To eradicate these awful mistakes and to prevent many wrongful deaths, they hired men to sit in the cemeteries with 
lanterns, and shovels to listen for ringing bells. These bells were tied to twine, and the twine was run underground to the wrists of the deceased. If the person awoke inside their coffin and scrambled for escape, their bell would sound six feet above, and the diggers would start digging. Hence, those buried alive were saved by the bell, and the diggers' work became known as the first graveyard shift. The only people at that time willing to work in the dark and sleep during the day. So, I met my new graveyard job at the mall. I stocked toys for the kiddies at Christmas time. I work in the dark like Quasimodo because they would never hire me for a daylight position. I guess I just don't appeal to their regular shoppers. And I definitely don't appeal to the kind of people that stop by our store after spending a few grand at Nordstrom. Come see the big hairy guy. Come on, come all, come down to the mall. See for yourself this big giant elf. I cannot dance for a dollar, and I will not give up my dreams for a job. I work in the dark to enjoy the sun. I plan my life during my 10-minute breaks while the nocturnal animals play in the empty parking garage amongst littered shopping bags, receipts, and price tags. As the world sleeps, dreaming of designer clothes, bottled water, and a Beverly Hills lifestyle, I debate with myself whether or not I have time to suck down one more cigarette. And if you can see the blue in this collar, then you know that I have learned quite well just how to differentiate between the daywalkers and those that roam the night. I prefer the light of the moon over your basic fluorescent office fixture. The kind of light that assumes a distrust between you and your boss. The kind of light that peeks into and around every corner. Those are the lights the stores at malls use to scare away the shoplifters. And those are the lights they shut off when the graveyard shift punches in. They know that something's going to be missing in the morning, so what's the point? The graveyard shift is creative, taking what is never rightfully theirs, but obviously no one else's either. There's something so missing in the morning when the day crew takes over that the customers can smell it under the hot lights of omniscience. It is the creativity born with night walkers. It is how much the day hates the night. You'll never see a pigeon hanging out with an owl. And you'll never see Beverly Hills hand me her phone number as she leaves the mall with her bags of hey. Look at me, while I enter the mall in an air of, hey, look at me. We're all the same, Beverly. Only you look pretty hot in your outfit. The way it exposes your midriff, your flat, flat stomach. I just wish you could say to me, hey, McGee, you look good in that dictionary. The way it exposes your ideals and manipulations, your faults and your ambitions. But we seem to take two different escalators to get to the same place in life. I'm kind of like banished royalty and you're upper class white trash. Day and night can never make love. They can only tease each other in a foreplay they call Twilight. And only things I regret at three in the morning as I solve the world's problems and chain smoke, chain smoke outside the mall is that I have no bell to ring. And rainbows never come out at night. Uh, and this one is uh, it's called Dirty Dimes. And this all took place in one night. It's a true story. I now know how unnoticeable I am in my new uniform. My appearance must seem so uncaring. Right now, I'm one of three people wearing a tie at 11 p.m. in San Jose, California. I'm four days and three-eighths into my new graveyard shift at Walgreens, one of America's mom-and-pop super drugstores. Those that use my services at night know that they can only come out once civilization has laid their heads to dream of newer, crisper $50 bills, maybe even hundreds. I really don't care that I have no money. They can put the aroma of a new car in a bottle. Why not that new money smell in an aerosol can? I'll reek of cash when I get home. I just won't have any of my own. But I really don't care. Retail's a whore that never sleeps, constantly screwing everyone that comes in for one kiss, and I'm her pimp, selling off everything she has and everything she is. Aisle number three is full of Easter candy. Like a pink and blue bunker of war, only the soldiers here are children armed with cap guns and silly string. Or at least I assume they are because I'm sure I'm asleep in the daytime when it all takes place. This job is bullshit. Whether I'm flipping burgers or telemarketing some cheap toxic product, it's all the same. It's not what I want or should be doing. My new boss watches me intently. She follows behind me and rearranges things I place incorrectly. I am three years old again and I could get used to it. My new uniform fits me like a condom on a vagina or a straitjacket on a snake. At least it's comfortable. I suppose I could get used to this. My boss has been here for at least three years. 
I've never held a job for that long. I don't think I could ever devote that much time to someone else's money. It is my money too, some of it. Even though it makes me feel weird, it's still my money that I'm earning, and I sweat for that paycheck every two weeks. Maybe someday, one of them might set me free. Now, one-tenth of the money I put into that cash register is mine. I counted it. I figured it out. It's not an exact science, but it keeps me sane and sweating, and this is when I start to care. I count the customers in tens, and every tenth customer is technically responsible for part of my next paycheck. It's easier to put a random face to it all. Whatever it is they purchase, they are buying it from me, from my sweat, from my aching feet, from my eight hours on the clock, and from my three hours to and from home on the bus. My seventh customer makes a line at my register with nothing in hand but a wad of money that smells like gratuity. He's a brawny bastard who looks like he just woke up from a respectful nap. He asks for instant film at 1.46 a.m. He doesn't want a stranger developing the pictures. He drives a cab the same time I clean this store. Most of his passengers are inebriated lonely women who want nothing more than anonymous backseat coitus and a ride home. They probably regret paying this man because for him it's all profit. He shows me pictures of his models, large-breasted 30 and 40-somethings sprawled out on the hood of his cab, looking drunk, horny, and married. The nipples in the photos are clearer than my thoughts on the actual situation. I ask to see them, and now I regret it. These ladies probably have children I went to school with, but I'm really trying not to care. 20 minutes later, customer 8 rings my bell, and I rush to the counter. I smile inside because she's a beautiful woman, and what would a woman this gorgeous be doing in my store at 2 a.m.? Her handbasket of groceries does two things. It immediately answers my question and it gives her a future, or at least a Saturday night. One that won't be alone because condoms are something you buy before you need them, just in case. She must know the man she's meeting up with, unless large condoms are a safe assumption between strangers. Maybe she's getting a ride from that cab driver, but it is my hopeful assumption that she is too young and too pretty for his portfolio. I ring her up, she pulls out her checkbook, and I want to laugh at her because she's clearly in a rush and I am in her way. But for some reason, she has decided to make her purchase with the slowest form of payment known to man. So I take my sweet time filling out the information from her driver's license. She never makes eye contact with me. She knows I know, but I really don't care. Customer number nine makes her way to my register. She's a tired mother who works late to raise her kids. She seems proud even though she still has her Denny's apron on. Her name tag says Tina, then old maid underneath it in invisible ink. I see it, and she wears it well. All I am is the guy who rings up her bleach detergent, toothpaste, milk, cereal, and children's cough medicine. Children's cough medicine. I feel sorry for her kid. I hate being sick myself, but I really don't care right now. She takes her change and leaves with a smile, and I can only hope that I put it there. I go back to aisle number three to continue its reconstruction, destroyed by daytime warfare, starring cowboys and Indians, carelessness and capitalism, I get paid to lie. The door chime rings. I hear two women enter the store. They sound amused and hurried. I walk on the shelf in front of me and wait for the bell on the counter. They are customer number 10. Their money is mine and they'll never know they personally helped me pay rent. I'm eager to meet them. Once they've completed their shopping, they ring the bell on the counter. I glide past the peanut brittle and crayons and turn toward the cash register where I do see two women. They sound amused and hurried, barely 30, looking for me while I patiently wait, and they patiently wait for my slow legs to reach them. My eyes are drawn to the counter, then to the items that they are buying, then to the skin of the woman closest to me. She's wearing a man's dress shirt, completely unbuttoned and no bra. The skin I see is her stomach and her chest. I can see a bit of her right breast, so I look up and away, ashamed. I'm forced to look at her face now, which is far too, too thin to be healthy. A bandana squeezes her bald head tightly. Her eyes bulge like those of su surprise. Her sunken face looks like that of a former beauty queen. She stares at the products as I ring them up, and I try not to stare at her small breasts every time her shirt swings open. So I'm realizing that she might not make it till Christmas. Her friend stands behind her, clean and strong. Maybe she's her lover. Maybe they're related. But none of the items I'm ringing up tell me who the friend is. They're cheap products. So, I assume that she is her lover. But maybe this woman, this exposed woman, she's ill. She bleeds from sores 
wounds. Maybe she's contagious, but she's afflicted with something. And these products have no brand name, so she's poor. They're poor together, and they're about to give me their money. She must have cancer. I want to strike up a conversation, something to get my mind away from this apparent mortality. Maybe she has AIDS. Maybe she shared the wrong needle with the wrong person, but every dying human looks like a junkie at some point. Her friend looks at her with worry, cementing all of my assumptions. She is her guardian, the one who will watch and is watching her die. The one who will pick out her cheap coffin. The only one willing to bury her. And there is so much love between these two. And I'm taking up way too much of their precious time. So I speed up the process and I bag their stuff as quickly as possible. And I hit the total button. $3.67 in low-grade medical supplies. Maybe these items will help her live another day. I wish I had just given them to her. But then I would be another man reminding a living woman that she's dying. The justice sleeps sometimes. The friend reaches into her pocket for some money, but the dying woman beats her to the counter with a handful of dimes. Dirty dimes. The kind collected in a cup on a street corner. Downtown dimes discarded by uptown businessmen and women who aren't dying this very minute. If everything would just freeze before me, I could let loose and cry and not disturb their shopping experience. But something deep down inside of me, in a place people rarely visit in public situations, there are picket signs being held up on my guts that read, let her see how you feel right now, and you're just jealous because she gets to leave. Back in the real world, my pity turns to anger as she picks lint out of the change on the counter. I'm so sad that this nice woman is so ill, but she's cracking smiles at me with big teeth through thin lips. She knows I know. She may be content with death, but for some reason, I can't be. I watch her count the dimes off the counter and into her bony little hand, and I count along with her, because I hope she comes up short. I take 36 dimes, and I try to assume some sort of apathy, but it never works. And these women leave with smiles on their faces that I couldn't have possibly given them. And for the rest of the night, I can't focus on shit. But I make sure that every customer after them gets a dirty dime in their change. And I try not to cry because Walgreens doesn't pay you for that sort of thing. It is 3 a.m. And I'm so tired of trying not to care about people who don't know me. I'm beating up the street tonight. I slept through the